Welcome to Visa's fiscal second quarter 2023 earnings conference call. All participants are in a listen-only mode until the question and answer session. Today's conference is being recorded. If you have any objections, you may disconnect at this time. I will now like to turn the conference over to your host, Ms. Jennifer Como, Senior Vice President and Global Head of Investor Relations. Ms. Como, you may begin. Thanks, Jordan. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Visa's fiscal second quarter 2023 earnings call. Joining us today are Ryan McInerney, Visa's Chief Executive Officer, and Vasant Prabhu, Visa's Vice Chair and Chief Financial Officer. This call is being webcast on the Investor Relations section of our website at investor.visa.com. A replay will be archived on our site for 30 days. A slide deck containing financial and statistical highlights has been posted on our IR website. Let me also remind you that this presentation includes forward-looking statements. These statements are not guarantees of future performance, and our actual results could differ materially as the result of many factors. Additional information concerning those factors is available in our most recent annual report on Form 10-K and any subsequent reports on Forms 10-Q and 8-K, which you can find on the SEC's website and the Investor Relations section of our website. For non-GAAP financial information disclosed in this call, the related gap measures and reconciliation are available in today's earnings release. And with that, let me turn the call over to Ryan. Hi, everyone. Uh, good afternoon, and thanks for joining us. Our financial performance in the second quarter of 2023 was very strong, with net revenues up 11% year over year. Non GAAP EPS was $2.09, up 17%. Overall, our global quarterly payments volume was up 13% year-over-year, year, excluding Russia and China. In the U.S., quarterly payments volume was up 10%. Outside the U.S., excluding China and Russia, payments volume was up 17.5%. Excluding intra-Europe, total cross-border volume remained strong, up 32% with cross-border travel volume at 130% of 2019. Process transactions grew 12% year over year. We remain confident that our strategy is focused on the right opportunities. In the second quarter, this strategy continued to deliver, driving strong growth through consumer payments, new flows, and value-added services. I'll talk briefly about our progress in each area. Let's start with consumer payments. Consumer payments remains a massive opportunity for Visa. Even with all the digitization over the last several decades, there is still a tremendous amount of cash and checks spent globally. There is a very long runway for growth in this business. In consumer payments, the flywheel has three parts. Grow credentials, more buyers on the network, grow acceptance, more sellers on the network, and drive engagement, more transactions. We continue to grow credentials, up 7% year over year through December, and 11% excluding Russia. And we now have more than 6 billion tokenized credentials, up nearly 90% from last year, excluding Russia. We continue to grow acceptance, with over 100 million merchant locations worldwide. And tap to pay continues to be a powerful driver of engagement. Globally, 74% of all face-to-face -face transactions outside the U.S. are now taps. In the U.S., we're at 34%, up 7x from three years ago, and up more than 10 percentage points from last year. A couple of highlights in the second quarter include U.S. quick service restaurants, where penetration surpassed 40%. And in key metro areas across the United States, we continue to see great traction beyond the success in New York and San Francisco. L.A., Detroit, Seattle, San Diego, and Oakland and Miami are all now over 40%. Mass transit continues to be one of the best ways to get people used to tapping and we've set records. In the first half of 2023, we processed more than 745 million Visa tap-to-ride transactions globally, up 35% over 
over the first half of last year. We've enabled 55 new transit systems, bringing our footprint to over 650. We also had some significant client wins in the quarter. Starting in North America, we are pleased to have renewed a multi-year agreement with TD, a top 10 North American bank for continued visa, credit, and debit issuance in both Canada and the US. In Canada, we renewed our relationship with CIBC with a new multi-year agreement for visa credit issuance. We renewed our partnership with Marketa, a leading FinTech issuer processor, and MoneyGram, who is utilizing Visa Direct for cross-border money movement and just recently signed a consumer debit agreement. In Asia Pacific, UOB, one of the leading banks in Asia, has renewed and expanded its relationship with us in Singapore, Malaysia, Thailand, Indonesia, and Vietnam for both credit and debit cards. OCBC Bank, the second largest bank in Singapore by market cap, renewed its flagship product and portfolio with us, the OCBC 365 credit card. MUFG Bank, the banking arm of Japan's largest financial group, renewed its long-term debit partnership. Chunghua Post, Taiwan's post office and the largest debit issuer in Taiwan, has renewed its long-term exclusive partnership with Visa. And in India, we're very excited about a long-term consumer credit contract with Axis Bank, targeting new affluent customer segments. Additionally, I want to highlight an exciting new product innovation that we launched in Japan with our longtime partner, SMBC. It is a single, flexible credential that a consumer can choose to use as a debit, credit, or prepaid card. SMBC calls the product Olive, and we think it could meaningfully enhance the buying experience for SMBC customers and users in many other countries around the world. Now to Europe. In Germany, we've signed a co-brand deal with Solaris and ADAC, which is Germany's largest automobile association with 21 million members. Visa is excited to be the new network of choice for one of the country's largest co-brand portfolios. In Israel, we renewed and expanded our relationship with our largest issuer, Bank Lumi. In Belgium, we recently reached agreements with six issuers to migrate over 2.6 million debit cards to Visa in the next few years, bringing our country total since 2021 to 6.5 million new Visa debit cards. And finally, in Latin America, from December 2019 to 2022, we have grown our credentials by 1.5x and our merchant locations by almost 2.5x. Over that time period, the percentage of our total volume that is point of sale payments versus getting cash out of an ATM has grown from 46% to 59%, demonstrating the cash digitization happening in the region. In Colombia, we're pleased to partner on a co-brand with LATAM Airlines, the largest airline in Latin America. We continue to strengthen our position in Brazil, renewing our partnership with Itaú, the largest private bank in the country. We also announced a new strategic deal with Banco de Brasilia that expands upon our existing agreement, including a popular credit program issued in partnership with one of Brazil's leading football teams with over 40 million fans. Also in Brazil, WhatsApp had already launched peer-to-peer -peer service to facilitate money transfer using Visa Direct. And recently, they announced they will be offering payments from consumers to small businesses as well. In more and more, we see clients work with Visa on multiple levels, across consumer payments, new flows, and value-added services. Natura, the world's fourth largest beauty group with four point I'm sorry, 4 million beauty consultants in Latin America is a recent example. In 2020, we announced a deal with them and we just renewed our agreement, which includes digital issuance of a Visa business credential and adds acceptance innovations as well as cyber source risk management solutions. Thus far in Brazil, we've issued cards to almost 50% of the Natura consultants 
And we love working with clients that take advantage of our full range of solutions. It's, it's Visa at our best, serving clients in multiple ways across our growth levers. Now let me turn to new flows. The potential payments volume opportunity in new flows is enormous, 10x that of consumer payments. New flows revenue in our second quarter grew more than 20% in constant dollars, excluding Russia. Commercial volume was up 15% in constant dollars, and Visa Direct transactions were up 32%, excluding Russia. We've been winning in new flows by executing our network of networks strategy. And two weeks ago, we announced a new network called Visa Plus that further extends our network of networks. This new network allows users to send and receive payments among different P2P apps through a personalized payment address, a Visa Plus pay name. This enables P2P payments from one app directly to another app, as well as gig, creator, and marketplace payouts. This can be done through an app, a neobank, or a wallet. We're connecting endpoints and form factors and enabling interoperability our network of network strategy at work. We're launching pilots with several partners, including Venmo, PayPal, Tabapay, and Western Union, with more to come soon. Let me now turn to Visa Direct. Visa Direct is also a great example of our network of networks. Visa Direct utilizes 66 ACH networks, 11 RTP networks, 16 card-based networks, and five gateways with the potential to reach nearly 7 billion endpoints globally. We continue to grow Visa Direct with new use cases and partners. For example, in Peru, Banco de Credito de Peru, BBBA, Interbank, and Scotiabank chose Visa Direct as their preferred network and Yellow Pepper as their technology enabler for the interoperability among their wallets and payment apps. Last year, we announced our agreement with the payments infrastructure platform Tunes to add send to wallet capabilities to Visa Direct. Similarly, this quarter, our cross-border reach continued to grow, expanding coverage to 32 new wallet providers across 22 countries by connecting to TerraPay, a leading cross-border payments infrastructure company. Together, Visa Direct and TerraPay can enable P2P remittances for individuals as well as business payouts through accounts, wallets, and cards. Enablers remain an important part of our strategy, and we're partnering with Fiserv to expand on their U.S. domestic Visa Direct business by commercially launching cross-border capabilities for their clients, starting with outbound payouts. I'll mention two other recent cross-border agreements. We signed a deal with Brightwell, a global payments technology company to leverage Visa Direct to expand cross-border remittances and payout capabilities for their customers in over 175 countries across a variety of industries such as travel and financial services. And earlier this quarter, PayPal's Zoom announced that customers in the United States can send money directly to an eligible Visa debit card in 25 countries utilizing Visa Direct. In the second quarter, Visa Direct cross-border P2P transactions, excluding Russia, grew nearly 50%. While Visa Direct is growing fast, B2B is the largest component of new flows. And traditional issuance is the core of what we do today in B2B, compri comprising the majority of the over $760 billion in commercial payments volume year to date. I'll highlight three important issuance deals. In Colombia, we renewed with Grupo Bank Colombia, the largest issuer and acquirer in the country, for commercial credit and prepaid, as well as consumer credit. Financial technology platform Audien has expanded its offerings with a Visa commercial card initially targeted to its global merchant customers. Visa and Stripe's issuing partnership offers card issuance to enterprise and startup consumers in the US, the UK, and Europe. And for cross-border B2B money movement, which you all know is about Visa B2B Connect, a solution that seeks to deliver predictability, speed, reliability, efficiency, data, and flexibility to our clients. 
We're building an entirely new network, and we're making progress. Over the last six months, we've signed nearly 30 banks in more than 20 countries, and payments have been routed to 90 countries globally. And there are several areas for additional expansion in B2B, such as new capabilities, new geographies, and new verticals. Today, I'll talk about two verticals, fleet and fuel and agriculture. In fleet and fuel, we're seeing a big shift in this vertical where the historically closed loop systems are opening up and receiving the benefits of our investment and innovation. For example, the Standard Bank in South Africa will issue Visa fleet cards in South Africa with plans to roll out across four additional priority markets across Africa in 2024. Over the past two years, Visa has signed or launched fleet-focused solutions for over a dozen providers with more to come. In Latin America, we're bringing our innovative capabilities to an untapped vertical, the agriculture industry. Agriculture represents nearly 15% of the workforce and nearly 25% of the exports in the region, which supplies nearly 15% of the world's food production. Visa has developed a solution called Visa Agro. It provides credit access to farmers in advance of their harvest so that they can buy inputs using Visa credentials with payment periods aligned with their production cycle. Visa Agro is live in six countries through partnerships with banks, fintechs, processors, and marketplaces. Now I'll touch on value-added services. Value-added services are equally important to Visa's accelerated growth. By offering compelling value-added services, we help to grow our clients' businesses and deepen our relationships with these clients, increase the yields on our own network volumes, and expand beyond our own network by adding value to non-Visa transactions. Our existing suite of value-added services is impressive. In the second quarter, we had about $1.7 billion in value-added services revenue, up 20% in constant dollars. And our clients continue to add value-added services. An example is Wells Fargo. As they modernize their acquiring solutions, they're working with CyberSource to offer enhanced product features and functionality for their merchant services customers. Or in Europe, fiscal year to date, we've signed on nearly 80% more clients than last year across 11 countries in our popular risk products, Visa Advanced Authorization and Visa Risk Manager, which together deliver increased transactions through higher authorization rates while also lowering fraud. Our network products, which include services such as account and address verification, stop payments, and smarter stand-in processing, continued to grow at a rapid pace with nearly 500 clients added year-to-date globally. We also have enhanced and developed new value-added services, which are helping to drive growth and innovation. I'll briefly share three examples, Visa Acceptance Cloud, Managed Services, and Risk as a Service. We spoke about Visa Acceptance Cloud last year, which moves embedded payment processing from individual devices to the cloud. It eliminates the need for expensive terminals as well as the cost and time to certify the processing software. I'm pleased to share that First National Bank in South Africa has launched this solution, and Visa expects more pilots to follow soon globally. Next is managed services, part of our advisory solutions, which is when we embed Visa employees with subject matter expertise within a client's organization to execute on a specific, actionable project such as an ongoing management of risk and fraud parameters, product implementations, or execution of customer engagement strategies. For example, one issuer for whom we provided end-to-end -end campaign execution enjoyed a 15% lift in spend and a 40% increase in activation. Managed services are bringing strong results for our clients and growing revenue twice as fast as our core advisory business through the second quarter. Finally, our risk as a service offerings also continue, be, continue to be utilized, powered by network level data, AI capabilities, 
and our risk experts. For example, our AI and machine learning enabled monitoring service identifies suspicious decline activity. For one client, we were able to identify a scheme where fraudsters were testing for valid accounts and then using the accounts to make fraudulent purchases. Visa blocked over $7 million in attempted fraud in just one month on behalf of this client. This is just one example, but you can see how these risk services enable us to both help our clients and generate revenue for Visa. Since launching six months ago, we've added nearly a dozen direct clients across three regions with a very active pipeline. In closing, as you all know, I've been at Visa for nearly a decade. And I can say I've never been more excited about the opportunities in front of us. We have a compelling strategy, a world-class team, fantastic clients, and an incredible set of capabilities that I believe are second to none. While the current environment still feels uncertain, we have contingency plans ready and are prepared to take action as needed. We're constantly seeking the right balance between the realities of the short term with the enormous opportunities ahead. So with that, now Vasant will lead us through the financial highlights from the quarter and our thoughts on the rest of the year. Thank you, Ryan. Good afternoon, everyone. In our fiscal second quarter, new rev net revenues were up 11% and GAAP EPS up 20%. Non-GAAP EPS was up 17%. In constant dollars, net revenues grew 13%, and non-GAAP EPS grew 20%. Adjusted for the discontinuation of operations in Russia, net revenue growth was around 18% in constant dollars. Net revenue growth exceeded our expectations due to strong value-added services and new flows growth, high currency volatility, and lower than anticipated client incentives. A few key highlights. In constant dollars, global payments volume was up 10%. Excluding China and adjusted for Russia, global payments volume was up 13%. As a reminder, January and the early part of February lacked Omicron impacts last year. Index for 2019, excluding China and Russia, global payments volume was up 61% which is a compound annual growth rate of approximately 12.5% over the pandemic year. U.S. payments volume was up 10% year over year, again helped by lapping the Omicron impact last year. Relative to 2019, U.S. payments volume was up 58%, compounding at 12% over the pandemic year. The cross-border travel recovery continues at the pace we expected, indexing at 130 versus four years ago, a five-point improvement from Q1. As expected, the rebound in Asia is now the primary driver. Travel in and out of Asia reached 2019 levels in the quarter, and travel into the U.S. was very close. We believe there is more recovery to come. Travel from mainland China has mostly benefited other parts of Asia so far, but early bookings suggest strong interest in Europe as the summer approaches. Our new flows and value-added services businesses continue to power ahead. Excluding Russia and in constant dollars, both businesses grew revenues at or about 20%. In the second quarter of fiscal year 23, we bought back approximately $2.2 billion in stock at an average cost of $222.09 and distributed $941 million in dividends. Now on to the details. In the U.S., credit grew 10.5% year-over-year, slightly faster than first quarter. U.S. debit grew 9.6%, up more than one point from Q1. U.S. card present spend grew 8%. U.S. card not present volume, excluding travel, grew 9%. As you look at the monthly cadence in the U.S. through the quarter, January and the early part of February benefited, benefited from lapping Omicron to varying degrees. In March, payments volume growth ticked down and has remained at similar growth levels through the first three weeks of April. The primary driver of the tick down in the growth rate has been U.S. ticket size, while transactions growth remains in line with Q1 levels at around 8%. Ticket size was up over 1% year over year in the first quarter and is down about 2% in March through April, 20, April, through April 21st. 
Ticket sizes are declining as inflation moderates. Most notably, starting in March and through the summer, we will be lapping the peaks in fuel prices last year. For example, in March 2023, fuel prices were nearly 20% lower than last year. In 2022, fuel prices continued to rise through spring and peaked in June. Also contributing is discounting in particular retail goods channels. You have heard various U.S. retailers comment publicly about price cuts they are implementing to clear out inventory or pass on reductions in costs. Across other categories of spend in the U.S., payments volume growth remains strong in services, in particular travel and entertainment. Non-discretionary spend growth in categories like food and drug is also holding up well. Another factor that is a potential drag on U.S. payments volume growth starting in March and through April is the impact of lapping higher tax refunds. Refunds are largely spent in the few weeks post-receipt. Based on IRS reported data through April 14th, tax refunds are 11% lower this year. We expect this headwind to abate as we get into May. Moving on to international markets. In constant dollars, international payments volume growth rates were strong through the quarter in the major markets. In Latin, Latin America was up 27% due to improved growth in Mexico and the South Cone. Our SEMIA region, excluding Russia, grew 29%. Europe was up 13%. Excluding the UK, Europe volumes grew 31%, reflecting share gains in multiple markets. Excluding portfolio conversions, volume trends in the UK improved. Asia-Pacific, excluding China, continued to recover, up 17%. Global process transactions were up 12%. Constant dollar cross-border volumes, excluding transactions within Europe, but including Russia and prior periods, were up 30, 32% year-over-year and up 46% versus four years ago. Excluding Russia, Year-over-year -year growth was higher by about three points, and the index to four years ago was higher by five points. Cross-border card not present volume growth, excluding travel and excluding intra-Europe, grew 6% year-over-year and was 77% about 2019. Adjusted for cryptocurrency purchases and Russia, cross-border e-commerce spending grew in the low double digits. Cross-border card not present, excluding travel and intra-Europe, represented over 40% of total cross-border volume in the second quarter. Cross-border travel-related spend, excluding intra-Europe, grew 59% year-over-year. The cross-border travel, excluding intra-Europe, indexed to four years ago, went from 129 in December to 134 in March, or up five points. Travel into Asia now exceeds 2019 levels, while travel out of Asia is around 2019 levels, improving 13 and 11 points, respectively, from the first quarter versus four years ago. Travel out of mainland China is a key driver to watch. With airline capacity coming back fast and streamlined visa issuance, Southeast Asia has been the biggest beneficiary of travel from mainland China. This is beginning to change as airline capacity is added in other corridors, especially Europe, and COVID-related requirements are eased. We expect the recovery of Asian, and in particular Chinese travel, to be a key driver of the final leg of the cross-border recovery. Travel outbound from the U.S. to all geographies continue to be strong in the low 150s, indexed to 2019. Travel inbound to the U.S., is still hovering just under 2019 levels. A strong US dollar, travel visa backlogs, and COVID restrictions have been dragged on the recovery, but all are beginning to ease. Europe, excluding intra-Europe, inbound and outbound remain strong, with a travel index to 2019 in the low 130s for outbound and high 140s for inbound. Travel into Latin America and the Caribbean also remained very strong, indexing in the low 160s to 2019 levels. Travel in and out of Semilla indexed in the high 140s versus four years ago, with outbound up more than five points from the first quarter and inbound up by about 
10 points. Moving now to a quick review of second quarter financial results. Service revenues grew 7% versus the 7% growth in first quarter of constant dollar payments volume. Exchange rate drag was offset by growth from business mix and pricing. Data processing revenues grew 10% versus the 12% process transactions growth. The primary reason is that our data processing revenues are impacted by Russia. However, our transactions growth is not. Adjusting for Russia, data processing revenues were up 14%, helped by value-added services spread. International transaction revenues were up 24% versus the 32% increase in constant dollar cross-border volume, excluding intra-Europe. Revenue growth was helped by high currency volatility, although lower than the first quarter, and pricing actions, offset by exchange rate shifts and business mix. Other revenues grew 16%, led by marketing and consulting services, as well as benefiting from acquisitions. Client incentives were 26.7% of gross revenues, below expectations due to some deal timing, client performance, and other items. Revenue growth was robust across our three growth engines. Consumer payments growth was led by the strength in domestic volumes, transactions, and cross-border volumes, as well as high currency volatility. New flows revenue grew over 20%, excluding Russia in constant dollars. Commercial volumes were up 15% in constant dollars, and 60% over four years ago. Excluding Russia, Visa Direct transactions grew 32%. Value-added services revenue grew 20% in constant dollars, driven by higher volume, increased client penetration, and select pricing actions. GAAP operating expenses grew 11%. Non-GAAP operating expenses grew 13%, led primarily by personnel expenses from headcount additions over the past year. Excluding losses from our equity investments of around $90 million, non-GAAP, non-operating income was $32 million, benefiting from higher interest income due to rising rates and a few other items. Our GAAP tax rate was 19.3%, and non-GAAP was 19.4%. GAAP EPS was $2.03, non-GAAP EPS was $2.09, up 17% over last year, including, inclusive of a three-point drag from the stronger dollar. Through the first three weeks of April, U.S. payments volume was up 6%, with debit up 6%, and credit also up 6%, compared to four years ago, they are up 54%, 63%, and 45% respectively. In key markets around the world, we saw continued strength. Process transactions grew 10% year over year and are 50% above four years ago. Constant dollar cross-border volume, excluding transactions within Europe, grew 28% and was 47% above four years ago. Card not present, non-travel growth was 77% above four years ago, Travel-related cross-border volumes were 31% over four years ago. Moving now to our outlook for the third quarter. Growth in domestic payments volumes remains stable around the globe. As we said last quarter, the recovery from COVID is behind us now for domestic volume. Post the Omicron impact from last year in January and February, U.S. domestic volume growth rates have ticked down in March, driven by the factors we discussed earlier. We believe that some of these factors will persist through the third quarter. As such, we are assuming March and April trends will continue in the U.S. for the rest of the quarter. In aggregate, we expect the international growth trajectory remains largely unchanged from the second quarter. On the cross-border front, the travel recovery trend has been steady and generally in line with our expectations so far in fiscal year 23. The cross-border travel index to 2019 excluding intra-Europe, has been improving at a rate of five to six points each quarter. We are assuming this trend is sustained through the third quarter. The big driver is recovery in Asia continuing, especially driven by mainland China. We expect Chinese travel to ex extend beyond Asia to Europe as we enter the summer. On the cross-border e-commerce front, we're also assuming recent trends continue, adjusted for crypto-related volatility. It is important to note that even as the cross-border business continues to recover relative to 2019, 
the year-over-year growth rate will continue to slow down as it has over the past few quarters. Also, currency volatility is moderating, and we are now lapping very high currency volatilities from the third quarter of last year. Our value-added services and new flows businesses have grown much faster than our consumer payments business. Sustaining faster growth rates for these businesses remains a critical priority. Client incentives growth is expected to be higher in the second half than it was in the first. This is driven by some delays in renewals that were expected in the first half, as well as some significant renewals that were anticipated in fiscal year 24, but are now happening in the second half of fiscal year 23. In the first half, client incentives as a percent of gross revenues were below our outlook range of 26.5 to 27.5%. In the second half, this percentage is likely to run above the high end of the range. We expect to finish the year in the upper half of the 26.5 to 27.5% range. When you pull all this together, third quarter net revenue growth is expected to be in the low double digits, inclusive of an approximately one-point drag from exchange rates. As we indicated previously, non-GAAP operating expense growth is expected to moderate through the year. Our expectations remain unchanged. Q3 non-GAAP operating expense growth is expected to be two to three points lower than the second quarter, inclusive of an exchange rate impact, which may add half a point to growth. And Q4 non-GAAP operating expense growth will likely be another two to three points lower than Q3. Non-GAAP results exclude certain acquisition-related items and the litigation provision from the third quarter last year. Non-operating income will continue to benefit from the attractive rates we are earning on our cash balances. As you know, short-term rates have been high lately, which is very helpful given that we always have very low durations on our cash balances. Interest income from cash will likely offset interest expense from debt by five to 10 million in the third quarter. Our tax rate is expected to remain in the 19 to 19 and a half percent range in the third quarter. As you've said previously, should there be a recession or a geopolitical shock that impacts our business, slowing revenue growth below our assumptions, we will of course adjust our spending plans by reprioritizing investments, scaling back or delaying programs, and pulling back as appropriate in personnel expenses, marketing spend, travel, and other controllable categories. In summary, as Ryan said, Visa today has three robust growth engines consumer payments, new flows, and value-added services. Our results in the second quarter attest that growth remains healthy across all three businesses. The opportunity is vast, and the runway for growth remains long. With that, I'll turn this back to Jennifer. Thanks, Hassan. And with that, we're ready to take questions, Jordan. If you would like to ask a question, please press star.